all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so this discussion today is the opinion piece written by two of the authors which i would share with you in a second in and published in the bmj so most of this discussion is an opinion and then at the end of this discussion i will add my opinion as well so please take it as an opinion so let's start our discussion So quick references, this is drbean.com. In the description, you have a beautiful link that brings you to the best possible prices for drbean.com. And somebody said, is that price so low because it is monthly? So no, it is one time price. There is no further charges. Okay, so with this second, this is about the BMJ. BMJ has been a very important um, journal for medicine. And I think it is in one of the top four or five journals. Here are the authors. One is Dr. John Gioridini. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. He is the research lead, Robinson Research Institute, Adelaide Medical School, Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences. So that is one author. The second author here near me, Limon McHenry. He is a McHenry. He is the Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at California State University. So I'm here in California, so it kind of California's ambience is increased with such folks. So here is the link, the illusion of evidence-based medicine. And as you can see, I have actually almost highlighted everything in here. So I'm not going to bore you by just reading it. I am going to first show you the illustrated um, illustrated narrative for the same verbiage and then we'll do some more discussion so let's start with my drawings so these are the gifts for humanity they are continuing and here this is a review this particular discussion is a review of the bmj opinion so here we have a nice amazing scientist and here is someone who can sponsor him and they're saying you'll get the grant to settle the science. So let's continue. How does this work? I intentionally did not write big pharma over here. Although in the opinion piece, they say big pharma or big pharmaceutical organizations. So why I wrote these, the crux of it, it is really the money at the end of the day. And interestingly, that money comes from us. We are the ones who are paying for all of this, which then enrich these organizations, which then allows them and empowers them to do a lot of good things, but also stay in the race by doing some manipulations that you are going to see. Again, it, this is an opinion. So the first thing that authors talk about, <clears throat> they're saying that the data that is going in medical research or drug research is owned by these organizations. And if I give you a contemporary example of this, remember that when the, when the FDA was asked as part of the Freedom of Information Act to provide the Pfizer vaccine data, which was the basis for the uh, approval or authorization, FDA said, we don't have that data. That data is going to come from Pfizer. So the data was actually with Pfizer. Pfizer had, as far as I understand, they had created the FDA briefing. They wrote it down. They sent it to FDA. FDA looked at that. I'm sure that there are some meetings as well that happened. And then they said, yeah, sure, done. So the data was with Pfizer. So Pfizer was objecting that, hey, we cannot give you the data. It is it needs to be anonymized and it needs to be X and it needs to be Y. And we have our commercial interest in that data's disclosure and so on. So Pfizer owned it. I was actually surprised at that time that FDA said, we don't have that data. I thought FDA would have said, give us anonymized data's copy or FDA could have non-anonymized data as well and kept it safe and secure. Anyways, data ownership is with these organizations which then allows them 
to not offer the raw data to researchers, to scientists, for the general public to see. And you can, you can discuss here, they say that in the opinion piece, that this data can be anonymized. It is not necessary that you tread on people's privacy by sharing the data. But they, they own the data and they do not offer the raw data to anyone. They also then are enabled to suppress the negative results because they have the data. And one of the ways that I understood from the opinion piece is that, for example, they have the data, but they do not do the further math on it. And when somebody asks, they can simply say, hey, we never did any math. We did not know what you're talking about. And when somebody else, for example, after lawsuits, if somebody acquires the data, the lawyers acquire the data, they give it to some biostatistician and they do the analysis and the whole thing falls apart, then the company simply says, we didn't do these math. So suppression of the negative results. Fail to report adverse events. And all of these opinions are actually backed up by examples of such failure. And I would very quickly show you these. It would be interesting to read them. So here, if you see, this is one, two, three, and four references. These references open up these links. And I'm going to just read one link for you. So this is a study, and I'm going to read abstract. They say here, selective reporting is prevalent in the medical literature, particularly in industry-sponsored research, which I think majority of the research nowadays is industry-sponsored. In this paper, we expose selective reporting that is not evident without access to internal company documents. The published report of study 329 of peroxetine in adolescent sponsored by GlaxoSmithKline claims that peroxetine is generally well tolerated and effective for major depression in adolescents. That's the narrative. By contrast, documents obtained during litigation reveal that study 329 was negative for efficacy on all eight protocol specific outcomes and positive for harm. So authors give this as an example to say they can not only suppress the negative results, they can actually just turn them around. So back here, the result of this, so authors have these paragraphs and they make a case and then they say the result of this is this. So the result of this behavior or this structure, this process, this is not just a big, day, big, big pharma saying we would do this. The rules, the regulations, the procedures, the processes enable them to do that. The authors say that this causes thwarted scientific progress. Of course, for example, you take today's vaccine, where you go uh, two years back or three years back, you pick up some drug and you want to do some more research on the data. You don't have the data. So how would you do the research? And if you do meta-analysis, you can only do meta-analysis on the researches that others have done. The big primary researches or the trials, you don't have access to that data other than whatever is published as a trials result. So that is pretty damaging for the public health. Then the authors say, the second problem is the commercial interest over common good. And I will put this thought to you, that can we actually have a private organization that can put their commercial interest aside? I don't think so. And the question really is then who is responsible to keep this commercial interest in check? I don't think that big pharma or any industry for that matter will self-govern themselves to say, I am going to be behaving like a good human being who is not greedy. Their function is to grow every year, every quarter, every month and make their shareholders happy. 
So if they said, hey, in the name of humanity, we had a ding, we went down, I think they will be, they will have a negative outcome for themselves. I can give you my example. Again, I am nowhere near comparable to these, but during this pandemic, when I focused more on COVID and then people became upset with me, there was a lot of damage to the business. I don't think I can just go back and say, because we were doing humanitarian work, this all is good for you, to my investors, right? So here, commercial interest, the result of that, that unchecked interest, this is my word now, unchecked, that's not authors. The commercial interest then causes influence of whom these organizations, big pharmas or big money owners, holders, they influence regulators, universities, they influence the research agendas. This is why you can actually see today, there is one study that says vaccine works, another study that says it doesn't work, and then the one study that says natural immu naturally acquired immunity works, and another study says that doesn't work. The research agenda is actually set by the money holders. And in this whole industry, healthcare industry, the fund holders or the purse holders or the purse string <laughs> controllers are big pharma. So authors say then the result of this kind of behavior is that people die or they end up with morbidities. They end up with damage that continues forever for, with them. And they have once again given an example of influenza vaccine where the published numbers were lesser than the damage occurring in reality. And that data was present with the company and the company did not act on that data. So if I, if I can very quickly see that one here, and they have the references to every one of these. This study, Pandemrix, pandem, pandem if I go to the bottom of this page, here they say, in Europe, one element of those plans was an agreement to grant license to pandemic vaccines based on data from pre-pandemic mock-up vaccine produced using a different virus. So this particular vaccine got the approval or authorization or whatever is the right way of saying it over there. But the vaccine was constructed based on a virus that was not this virus, that was some other virus or a mock-up virus. Another elemental adopted element adopted by countries such as Canada, US, UK, France, and Germany was to provide vaccine manufacturers indemnity from liability of, for wrongdoing, thereby reducing the risk of lawsuit suits stemming from vaccine-related injury. We are seeing that as well. So then they say that uh, in an interview with the BMJ, Liam Donaldson, Donaldson's, England's chief medical officer at the time, recalled the situation around October 20, 2009, rollout, the UK worked for several years on its pandemic influenza plans as part of the global court. So, but look at this part here. I had actually undisclosed problems. Here, look at this one. In documents obtained through the pre-trial discovery process, see supplementary data, Prosecutors suing the Irish Minister of Health, Health Service, Executive Health Product Regulatory Authority, and GSK have found a string of GSK post-marketing safety reports that show, and post-marketing means in production, being given to, to populace, shows a striking difference in the number and frequency of adverse events reported for three GSK pandemic vaccines approved and used across the world. Pandemrix, Aripanrix, a similar H1N1 vaccine that also contains ASO3 adjuvant and an H1N1 vaccine without adjuvant. No brand name is given. And what they saw was, they actually have the numbers over here. 
Let me actually show you those numbers. That is so interesting. So here, they had actually given the numbers of five times increase Bell's palsy. So one second. Here. The BMJ conducted its own analysis of the adverse events, most of which seem to have been reported spontaneously to GSK for a range of concerning adverse events. So now remember what's happening. The data is extracted from GSK as part of a lawsuit. That data is then used by BMJ to do analysis on it. That means the company could have done this analysis as well, and they may have. And here is the result. For a range of concerning adverse events, reports were coming in for pandemics at a consistently higher rate than for other two GSK pandemic vaccines. So this new vaccine that got approved quickly had higher adverse events, four times the rate of facial palsy, four times, eight times the rate of serious adverse events nine times the rate of convulsions. Overall, pandemics had proportionally five times more adverse events reported than arypnarix and the unadjuvated adjuvanted vaccines. Here, this is the new drug, new vaccine that got approved, pandemrix, and this is the old one. And this was the change, and this data was with the company. But the result was that they did not really. And if you see here their statement, it's actually very interesting. The BMJ asked the UK Department of Health why it recommended Pandemrix over Baxter's Selvapan, but the department also declined to comment, calling the question quite technical and suggesting we submit a freedom of information request for an answer. Similarly, if you go to what GSK said, GlaxoSmithKline, they actually simply refused to agree to this. So somewhere over here, you would see that GSK said, here, GSK told the BMJ that further research is needed to confirm what role pandemics may have played in the development of narcolepsy among those affected. That's that's the answer. You you can actually see a similar answers nowadays as well. So I wanted to give you an example. So back here, the result is people either die or they end up with morbidities or diseases that can affect them forever. For example, neurological damage can continue for a long time or cardiac damage and so on. Then the researchers say another problem is that these companies are beholding to their shareholders. And the shareholder interest is also very important. And not only just the interest, shareholders have a power hierarchy. And that is actually understandable. The greater the number of shares, the more influence that shareholder has. They have a power hierarchy. They have a power structure. That also creates a narrative and a mission for the company that may not be entirely just in favor of human beings, that may be just in favor of earning more money. And I, I think that it's not that all of the board members always do that, but this is your opinion that shareholders also have a great influence on how a company behaves. This also, they said, causes product loyalty, which is fine. I mean, a company that sells a product are going to be loyal to their product. I keep cracking up at the Johnson & Johnson. One dose got in the race, got approved, and now CDC said day before yesterday that anybody who had BMJ should go get two doses of messenger RNA vaccines as well. 
meaning it was really not a vaccine. This is my opinion. So you can discard this, not authors. So product loyalty, which is understandable. PR and propaganda. These are going to the extreme. Again, the PR is for get, to get your um, vaccine, for example, approved. Remember in the beginning of the pandemic, we had certain small company CEOs come and join us who talked about their product and their products never went in anywhere. They actually, one CEO had a monoclonal antibody ready, um, I think a couple of months after the pandemic started and he never, their product never saw the light of day. I also know an example of a person, a friend, who wanted to have a drug that has been proved in trials to be useful for COVID, in trials, good trials. And they used that trial, sent the documentation to the FDA, CDC, and the answer was, we only accept those uh, trial results that are submitted by big companies or big pharmas. You are not a big pharma, so we cannot accept it. So what is the... Truth in there, I don't know, but this is what I heard from them. Okay, so shareholders. The end result of this power structure um, working for shareholders instead of for humans while being in the pharma or healthcare industry is that scientific integrity is destroyed, damaged. And that actually makes sense. I think... In the healthcare industry, only those people should be allowed who have this particular inclination to serve and to help. This is a specific personality type. And these personality types should be more aligned with this field instead of everyone. But anyways, that's a huge change I'm asking for. So this is the power uh, with the shareholders. Then... Authors continue and they say the next big issue. Interestingly, they never talked about government. Maybe this was a too big of a thing for them to poke. So they didn't talk about government itself. Instead, they said, for the universities, and universities hold a lot of knowledge and capacity to research. So they said universities get less funding from government. The result is Big Pharma offers them funding. But when the funding comes from the Big Pharma, then of course you would expect them to try to dictate the agendas as well. So what happens is when the funding comes from the Big Pharma for universities, then the university's departments that are doing research start becoming instruments for Big Pharma. I actually have knowledge of some of my friends who are in universities who have said that we reached out directly to, for example, NIH to say, give us funding. We think we have a very important vaccine-related research to do, and here is our plan and we don't want to do it with the help of anybody else. You sponsor us. And NIH simply refused. And I'm sure that this is very common. So the result is these grants, these sponsorships, these supports come in from big pharma as well or big money holders. When it comes in from there, then there is a, even if they don't articulate it, that we expect it this way, they, there is an influence. So the authors say that these departments from university become instruments for pharma. This is their words. Then the pharma controls the research agenda in the university, post writing in journals for the big pharma. And I can actually understand, for example, understand that this happens. For example, the FDA briefing documents are actually written by these big organizations, they write them and send them over to say, present this and discuss this. So they do all the homework and not, according to authors, not only the big pharma does their own homework, they also mark their own homework as well and say this is A+. So the writing 
in various journals emanating from various departments in some universities could actually be coming from the articles written by the ghostwriters who are feeding them and the, then these are fed to the journals and uh, publishing areas. Then they talk about CME. So for CME, I put a question mark here, continuous medical education. I am in that business as well. And I, so for example, I have never ever accepted any sponsorships, any grants, any way. I don't even run ads on drbean.com just for this purpose that my educational material is not tainted by some external influence. I also do not accept lectures or talks from anybody who is going to be, who's working in a, for example, a surgical devices company or a medical devices company or a medical drug company or vaccine and so on. I don't, do not accept them. But in the US, there was a time that 50% of continuing medical education credits were actually sponsored by Big Pharma. That was stopped. I believe it was stopped in 2016. I may be wrong about the year. And that was about more than $1.2 billion yearly that was contributed by Big Pharma. Why I know this is because that burden of buying those CME without the support of Big Pharma then fell back to the individuals and their hospitals or clinics or organizations, educational organizations. So at least in the US, I believe that there is a there is an attempt to reduce that. Although, if I can show you a couple of references here. So if I go here, this is Pharma MedTech spending accounted for 28% of CME funds in 2017. This used to be, I believe, 50% in 2016. Then they had asked them to phase it out, and I believe it would then stop uh, in the coming years. And here is the ACCME report. That is the organization that governs overall the CME. And they have talked about various uh, organizations that can help or not help. So anyways, there are reports about this. Um, I feel it is better controlled in the US for a six, seven years ago, this started. Still, CME or other ways to sponsor and influence a doctor or the decision makers. And the authors go to the next step and they say, there is another problem. And that problem is that big pharma looks for those people who are successful in academia. So let's use me for an example, although I'm not the right fit for this discussion, uh, but someone who has influence on some people. There are actually academicians inside the universities that have a lot of influence. And so the authors are saying that Big Pharma actually finds them. They profiles them. They see what kind of talks do they do. Are they pro this or are they anti this? And based on their profiling, then they decide which such influencer or key opinion leader should we partner with. And this is actually a very interesting um, situation, not just for medical, but for other fields as well. You must have watched sponsored videos on YouTube. I have received many, many messages to say, we would like to sponsor your video or we would like to invest in your work. And I run away from that, although it is lucrative to become an influencer and do sponsored videos. But the point is, at least for me, it would taint my way of presenting or my thoughts of what I want to say. So there are two things that are, if you look at me from outside, you can say, well, this is not very wise. But I think for my business and for my own um, freedom of my expression, which is not very free, is number one, I do not have any shares in any pharmaceutical industry 
company at all. And you can say it is unwise because I could become rich with some of those shares. So I do not. And that allows me a complete freedom for having no such interest with the company to say Moderna is better or Pfizer is better or Johnson Johnson is better because I have some shares with them. And the second is I do not do sponsored videos. I do not. The only sponsorship I get is you. That's about it. Or the YouTube ads. And you know that there is a lot of suppression still. But that is, if we go back here from me, back to the key opinion leaders, Big Pharma finds people who are influential. Then they select them. Then they are made into product champions. So these influential people are asked to represent the trials, to talk about the trials, to discuss the value of these products, and they become product champions. That actually is a really bad thing, but that happens. The result is that the independent critical evaluation of a drug's performance is suppressed. Because the person who may have a voice is influenced. So then what happens? Then they say that these key opinion leaders actually are given the freedom of expression like academic freedom of ex expression. For example, in the US, if you are a teacher, for the most part, you are allowed to speak what you want to. Of course, I am a teacher, but I'm not allowed to speak what I want to. That is because we have um, suppression of expression from platforms like YouTube. Interestingly, the BMJ's opinion piece does not talk about social media and mainstream media's uh, behavior. They just stay within this structure. So here they say it is interesting that such key opinion leaders are given the freedom of expression within the universities, within the journals, and within the industry. So they enjoy that freedom of expression while misusing that to champion a drug. The result of this is that the propagation of views by these key opinion leaders, even if they are, these views are contrary to the actual evidence-based medicine, they can still get away by saying it because everyone is accepting of their message. So this is another structure that is present. Then, in the final discussion, again, authors have left out some areas. They left out governments, they left out mainstream media, and they left out social media. And I'm sure there are more. Then the authors talk about regulators. A regulator's job is regulation, correct? However, authors say that regulators are industry funded. And then regulators use the trials and the trial data to approve a drug. That trial and the data is actually conducted by the Big Pharma or Big Pharma sponsored activity and created or compiled by Big Pharma. So regulators who should be as independent as possible cannot be because what they are given is what Big Pharma decides. And here the authors say this is like marking your own homework and giving it to the regulators to say, I marked it. Just put your stamp on it and say, awesome. So then what happens? They say that government, this is the only statement they make about government. They say government is unconcerned. Regulators are captured. That means there is no initiative either by the government or by the regulators to remove research from the industry. So, meaning making research work independent of the industry that is doing business with healthcare. 
They say there is no initiative because there is no interest. Government doesn't have the interest, regulators are captured, so they will not have the interest. And I'm sure that there are some regulators who are not captured. So, back here. Secondly, the authors opine that the cleanup of publishing model is also not corrected. So, here is another problem they are demonstrating, and that is publishing something also is an industry, correct? So, the publishing journals they actually take money. Uh, I think you know that 5,000 to more is needed to publish your paper. That is how they earn. So publishing model depends upon reprint revenue, advertising revenue, and sponsorship revenue. All of these can affect publishers' behavior as well. So the whole network the whole process of finally helping you and me is structured this way. And I was, I was doing this here somewhere. Okay, so I didn't draw that here. <clears throat> At the end of the day, this all is done in our name and with our monies. If, for example, research is done, for example, vaccines are produced very fast, that was taxpayers' money. If we buy the drugs, the companies are becoming rich with that. There is another component that is missing in this discussion, and that is insurance companies and their behaviors. So now, what is the proposal by the authors? What do they think should be a fix? So they say, our proposals for reforms include liberation of regulators from drug company funding. I think that's a fair thing, important thing. Taxation imposed on pharmaceutical companies to allow public funding of independent trials. I think this is critical, that the trials should become independent. Not only that you have a third party that is looking at the trial results and is an independent party, that's not sufficient. The trial's conduct itself should be an independent organization and public, funded by public's money, so working with public. And perhaps most importantly, anonymized individual patient-level trial data posted along with study protocols on suitably accessible websites so that third parties, self-nominated and commissioned by health technology agencies, could rigorously evaluate the method, method, methodology of the trial and the results. This, I could not agree more. Data should be there. One doesn't have to go to the Freedom of Information Act to say, now please give us data, and they say, fine, we'll give you the data in next five years or 70 years. It should be part, the package for the results should have it. With the necessary changes to trial consent forms, participants could require trial lists to make the data freely available. The open, <coughs> excuse me, the open and transparent publication of data are in keeping with our moral obligation to trial participants, real people who have been involved in risky treatments and have a right to expect that the results of their participation will be used in keeping with principles of scientific rigor. Industry concerns about privacy and intellectual property rights should not hold sway. And they have given examples of how, let me just very quickly before presenting you my opinion, this is one study that they refer where the outcome is opposite to what was said then there is this study, Narrative Review, the promotion of gabapentin and analysis of internal industry document. And here they say, the promotion of gabapentin was a comprehensive and multifaceted process. Advisory boards, consultants, meetings, and accredited continuing medical education events organized by third-party vendors were used to deliver promotional messages. 
these tactics were augmented by the recruitment of local champions and engagement of thought leaders who could be used to communicate favorable messages about gabapentin to their physician colleagues. Research and scholarship were also used for marketing by encouraging key customers to participate in research, using a large study to advance promotional themes and build market share, pay medical communication companies to develop and publish articles about gabapentin for the medical literature and planning to suppress unfavorable and planning to suppress unfavorable study results. Risk of cardiovascular events. So this risk, this is another study that they link. Then as I showed you this one, this, this is a fascinating read, how this vaccine had lots of uh, adverse events, but they were just said nothing, nothing, no, no flag, no safety flags observed. Okay, so then here is my opinion. And so again, this is my opinion. I may be wrong. Mainstream and social media are crucial players at this time. You have seen this. At this time, at least, mainstream media played a critical and important role. And in my opinion, they caused a lot of damage. So that is one area which need to be looked at. For example, why should someone in mainstream who doesn't even have a credential of being near a medical school? They probably didn't even eat a burger near a medical school's building and they are providing advice. That should not happen. Social media. So it is interesting that social media has self-appointed fact checkers. But you're seeing that these fact checkers are just all over the place. You have seen that companies are writing rules with the drug names specified in the rules to say you cannot talk about this drug in this context. So social media has an interesting capture of the humans at this time. And that is, we actually have no other place to go and have a discussion than the social media platforms. Although we are probably regretting now, but there is no other place other than maybe sitting together in a Starbucks cafe. And they have us captured on their platforms and then they can suppress at will. And third thing which is very interesting is that in this whole discourse, there is a successful propaganda piece that has allowed the public opinion to be divided in two groups. So someone sitting higher up, pulling the strings, doesn't even need to do anything more because people are just fighting with each other. They are tearing each other down. So I think these two players, social media and mainstream, they need to be better regulated about medical discussions. Then these medias are actually suppressing as well. So it's not just that there is a propaganda piece that amplifying a certain message. There is a suppression piece actively happening I can never imagine in my life at least in the US, that you will find people, medias that would suppress or silence or ban or censor. But that is happening. So the dialogue, the information, the opposing views are all stopped. So how do I think we should do more? I think what we should do is, number one, we should forbid high level, executive level employees from large corporations to join regulatory agencies. They should not be able to do that. So that means a person who is working in a regulatory agency, this should be part of their career decision to say, when I go in this industry or this agency, I can never then go to a regulatory, uh, to a pharmaceutical company. This should be part of the career discussion and decision. 
forbid high level employees of regulatory agency from joining large organization and vice versa i think that is important to stop forbid either of these employees to join startups as board members or pr teams they can join as research workers or other internal internal facing members because there is a lot of such activity as well where someone figures out in a big company or from an agency what kind of new product is needed then they go and become part of a startup and promote them and then you know take them all the way up then tax big corporations to fund independent organizations which author said that to formulate a non government non corporate drug review board so not only going forward we should do better we should create a board now to look at previous anomalies in evidence and evidence based reviews and approvals and authorizations and remove drugs and authorizations or approvals that were incorrectly approved the house needs to be cleaned up because these are not candies these are drugs that have positive and negative health benefits or harms and so those that were harming but were still approved by whatever processes you saw these need to be removed and not only removed companies should be fined for hiding the data or misrepresenting the data non medical hospital management should not be part of therapy policy and enforcement this i i have a so many times mbas and other non medical folks are running hospitals and they just simply blindly obliged and and implement certain algos and that's about it they should not be the decision makers for the algorithms and management policies that should be in the hand of medical folks then the political leaning of the state medical boards state medical boards are really more political than more technical they're not technocrats they are politicians unfortunately sadly so my uh, apologies for offending them but that's what's happening so state medical boards and the organizations like emma who says we know we have a rule that we will not come between the physician and the patient but we would still like to come between them for this specific drug these kind of anomalies need to be corrected then find the media pundits gurus that represent drug therapies without having the credentials to discuss them find them if they have the audacity to say someone who doesn't take this drug we should leave them behind such folks should actually be fined and then on yearly basis make public all communications about drug trials and approvals this should be a this should not be a freedom of information act in uh, request it should just be a yearly disclosure just like on the finance side the billionaires are supposed to disclose what shares did they buy or sell i think every quarter or every 6 months big pharma should disclose every year what trials were run what approvals were granted where is the trials data and that anonymized data should be a standard process on yearly basis just like they re release their earning statements so this is the discussion thank you very much for uh um, hearing me out this is an opinion piece interesting one um please read this 
the actual article tell me what do you think um are they on the right track or do you i was thinking when i was reading it those who are in these industries and in these positions they would actually have even more to add so if you you have something please comment and it will be interesting to see so with this please there is a link in the description which is for dr bean premium content drbean.com check it out it's a one time payment it's not monthly recurring payment and i think you would like that price there are a thousand pieces of content that are awesome. There is also a link to buy me a coffee if you would like to support this work and energize my brain with coffees. <laughs> or you can use PayPal or you can become a patron. And please definitely like, subscribe and share. I would see you on the other channel in a few minutes for chit chat. Bye bye for now.